Hello and welcome to the Horticulturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas and we do post a video every week on a Friday so do hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing horticultural adventures. And don't forget we do shorts as well so if you've got a question you'd like to ask me put it in the comments below and I'll make the best effort I can in answering it. In 60 seconds or less. But yeah. Stephen, where are we? I can see the most glorious 19th century garden behind us. Well, in fact, we're in my own home territory of Mount yes. Macedon. Yes. And we're in a garden called Durrell and it dates right back to the 1870s really? and the current family has had it since 1919 so a pretty impressive record i have to well, say well in australia yes a hundred years more of the same family in yep. a garden that's yeah, amazing so three generations and a big thank you to the family and the head gardener here who's allowed us to come in today and film yes and so this is one of those gardens i've had a lot of lot to do with over the years so it's lovely to come in and visit it and see how it's just, it's advancing and changing as the seasons go on. Well, we'll get to your involvement, Stephen, but yeah. what are we here to look at particularly? All right. Well, the main focus of our visit today yes. is a section of the garden yep. that was uh, landscaped back in the 1920s yes. by probably one of Australia's most famous landscape designers. Yes. And her name was Edna Walling. Edna Walling. Now, Edna Walling is still, I was going to say a household name, but Perhaps not a household name, but still very well known in horticultural and garden circles. She is. A century um, later. And in fact, quite a number of her landscapes are still in existence, mm. which is an unusual occurrence because landscapes tend to change and lose some of their integrity as time goes on. But there are quite a number of very good examples of her gardens around uh, Victoria and Australia in general, uh, and this is one of them. Well, without further ado, we should maybe go and have a look. But before we do, Ooh. maybe let's just have a little look about the garden generally before we get to the Edna Walling bit. What a good idea. Let's go. Well, Stephen, starting at the gate here, it does remind me of two other great historic gardens on Mount Macedon. We've seen Arkhilly and Alton. Yes, exactly. So we have done videos on both of those gardens, yep. so could be worth your while going in and having a look as well. So the first thing that strikes me is these incredible mature trees. There's all sorts of cedars and deciduous trees. So when was the garden planted? All right, well, the garden itself dates back to around about 1870-ish. Yeah. So very early. In fact, when you think about it, Victoria and New South Wales were separate uh, identities back then because yep. we didn't become a country till 1900 yes. so it's quite remarkable that these places were so well thought of and had established such amazing gardens way back in colonial times. Yes. So these gardens were, of course, the place where people came to get away from the heat of the city in the summer. Yep. So they work like the hill station gardens of Darjeeling and Kashmir and places like that in India. And can I just say, it feels like it today. <laughs> it is summer and it's got to be minus two degrees. Yeah, well, it is, it is really cool. But there you go. It's uh, just the season we're having, unfortunately. So the garden dates back to that era and it's been loved and cared for right the way through well over a century and a half. Well, Stephen, um, can you maybe just give us an overview of the garden before we go to the Edna Walling bit? Um, stylistically, it looks to me a bit like the others, very British. It is. I mean, they were colonials. They yeah. wanted a little piece of the homeland. Yeah. So they landscaped in a sort of fashion that would have been popular back in England at much the same time. Mm. Uh, they used a palette of plants that was basically the same. So let's talk about that because mm. behind us, which we can see cunningly over here, are some rhododendrons, yes. which are still in bloom, even though it is summer, allegedly. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> doesn't feel like it, but there you go. Yes, so they would have used the classical palette of plants. So things like rhododendrons, yep. uh, all sorts of large deciduous trees, oaks. We're, we're beneath an oak. Yeah, and there's lindens, there's beech, all that sort of thing. And of course, very large conifers, there's spruces, there's cedars, mm. um, there's Douglas firs. There's a whole range of different conifers that were used as well. Mm. So it was in keeping with the sorts of plant material that they used at the time, mm. because believe it or not, our Australian bush was seen as the scrub. Yeah. It, it was in lots of derogatory terms for it actually and it needed to be cleared away to put a civilised landscape in place mm. and that's the sort of thinking that was going on at that time. That's called colonialism ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> and to put this in context for our viewers as well so we are up Mount Macedon, yes. so Melbourne is a much lower uh, elevation yes, so the exactly. climate here is cooler, moister, uh, and, 
and it's got a deep soil and so it's a perfect place to Very develop a garden yeah. and it's a great place to escape the heat of Melbourne summer. Yeah. So that's exactly what they did. Most of these houses weren't lived in permanently. People mm. had their Melbourne residences yep. and they would come up to Mount Macedon to escape the summer heat, uh, enjoy their summer holidays, uh, mix with their friends, do horse riding, play tennis, yes. have musical soirees, all Sounds those like things. heaven. I want to I want to live that life. Goodness yeah. me. Well, I think then we've set the scene. We should now go and look at the Edna Walling Garden and just explore that. Yes, and put it in context with this property, I think. Excellent. Let's go. All right. Well, here we are. So there's the house behind us, That's which is right. a replacement house. The original was burnt down. 2018, the house was burnt down by a house fire and a new house was built in its place. So as you can see, we sort of are descending into it. And the first thing is it's really quite intimate, isn't it? It is. It's, a, it's an interesting part of the garden because most of the rest of the garden is large sweeping. Yes. Big trees. And big vistas. Yeah, large sweeping garden beds. But this part of the garden, the Edna Walling bit of the garden, yeah. has a much more intimate and enclosed feeling about it yeah so although it sits into the garden really well it has a quite different feel yeah yeah it does it mm. does it does so 1925 when edna designed this yep. where was she at in her career then in australia well, was she, she well known well she was becoming well known she yep. had only started her business around about 1920. oh okay so she was quite new to the business she'd done her training at burnley college which is a Australian Horticultural College, which is probably world famous for the uh, the amount of information and the degrees and things that came out of that place. So what era was this? Uh, that was in the um, 1914, I think she joined uh, wow. at Burnley as a student. So she would have been quite a, a pioneer in terms of a woman studying in 1914 at that yes, college. Yes, exactly. Mm. So she'd come out from England with her family. She was used to the English countryside. Yeah. Uh, so she had a sense of the sort of landscape and, in fact, the climate that we work with here. And so this would have been one of the early landscape jobs that she did. Right. And she was very much influenced by people like uh, Gertrude Jekyll. Yeah. Um, and... It was about spaces, shapes, forms, using familiar plants, which was a good thing at the time because yeah. uh, they were the sort of plants that fitted into this garden because of its history. Yeah. Uh, if she'd done this landscape in the 1940s, yes. she may well have actually used Australian native plants, which sounds like an awful thing to say, but they wouldn't have actually sat in this environment uh, as well as the exotic plants that she used. Mm. Well, I think what we might do is just go and look at some of the things that are specific to her that yep. this kind of garden represents. But I am just going to swing around yes, cunningly. like we can. So this is the end of the garden here with this beautiful gate and paddock. Mm -hmm. And out there is this wonderful meadow with these beautiful mature eucalypts. Yes, it's uh, quite a nice finish to the garden. Although if it had gone to the full extent that it was going to, that out there would have had a water feature yeah and it would have had some colonnades and a swimming pool and that's the area that would have been uh extended out into the paddock so yeah, yeah, yeah. that was never carried through because the owners believed that it was important for them at least to have space for their ponies which is charming isn't it yeah well it is who so needs a colonnade and a swimming pool when you have to graze your your ponies well i have to say car mckinnon a dear old friend of mine who made it almost to 100 yeah she used to ride around the property even into her 80s really so she was very into her horses and so i can sort of understand where the family was coming from because yeah. i used to come up here uh I'd have a drink with car we'd gossip about people in the neighborhood <laughs> um, and i'd talk about what i was up to and we'd walk the garden decide on where things might need to be removed yes. where new things could be planted yeah uh, and so my connection with this garden goes back quite a long way so you've, have you supplied things for this garden too? I have. I, there's a number of plants around the garden here that I could point out to you that have come via my hands. Yes. So I've had my little bit of a way with this garden, just as I have with several of the other Mount Macedon gardens, to be honest. But hang on, let's play six degrees of separation. Yes. So who was the lady you were just referring to? What's her name? Uh, Car McKinnon. Or Car. Karine McKinnon. Karine McKinnon. So she was in her 90s, 99 when she died. Yes. So she would have known Edna Walling. Yes, because she it was, was her young father girl. who had the landscape uh, executed by Edna Walling. So you are two degrees away from Edna Walling. 
Well, in some sort of context, yes, I suppose no, you, you are. say that. That's how yes. the game works, which means yes. I'm three degrees of separation from Ed Walling. And you had no idea how famous you were, did you? No. Well, anyway, let's go and look at some of the Ed Walling specific elements of this garden. All right. What a good idea. Well, now, Stephen, should we talk about the type of plants that Edna used around here? And could we assume that some of these are from her time, from her planting? Yes, uh, I would definitely say that there's uh, the vast majority of the larger plants here would have been part of her planting. So I would say the large rhododendrons, the very large mollus azaleas that are just finishing around us here. Yeah. There's some very big Japanese maples here as well. Can I just say they are, I think in Australia, the oldest looking Japanese maples I've seen. They are so beautiful. Mm, they are, they're fantastic trees. And she probably sourced them locally because we actually had a nursery at Mount Macedon yeah. called uh, Sanctuary and Taylor Nursery mm. and it closed in 1930 mm. so there's a very good chance since she did this landscape in 1925 yeah. that many of the plants would have been sourced locally through Sangster and Taylor Nursery which was quite literally a few hundred meters up the road. Oh, would have been logical and context there 1925 what was the nursery industry like in Melbourne then? Well, there in, many players? Uh, in fact, it, it had gone through a heyday and was uh, was actually in a bit of doldrums by that stage. Ah. Earlier, uh, before the turn of the century, T Sangster and Taylor started somewhere around about the 1870s. Yeah. There was Smith's Nursery in Riddles Creek, which was another very well-known nursery nearby. Mm. And they were importing vast amounts of plants from overseas, mm. as were some of the slightly later nurseries in the Dandenongs, the Bolter's Rhododendron Nursery and some of the others. Yeah. Uh, this was all prior to quarantine quarantine restrictions coming in. The glory days of yeah. importation. So they could just bring stuff in anything they wanted. In fact, mm. it was it was seen as a morally good thing to introduce something that naturalized. Ooh. Now, of course, we look at that. Paying in the price too, because mm -hmm. a lot of these things are now so established. So certainly, all of the older trees in here are probably original to Edna Walling. Yeah. Some of the understory plantings may not be, mm. but certainly I'm sure she would have used hellebores and there's masses of hellebores yeah. naturalising around in this garden. Mm. And uh, we have done a hellebore epic special, which we'll link we below. We did, in fact. And there is right up in the top uh, circle up there an ancient old hydrangea quercifolia, which mm. could easily date back to the time of Edna Walling. Right. Uh, but there have been successive plantings done since. A big acacia melanoxylon, or what we would call a blackwood here in Australia, mm. fell down a few years ago and opened up a lot of light into the top part of the garden. So new maples have been planted up in there in the last decade to 15 years. Yeah. Uh, and they're now starting to establish and start casting the shade back again that the garden needs. Now, anything that strikes you as being unusual in terms of the plant choice that might be from that era? Yes, there's there's... Two or three things that I find really intriguing yes. in this particular garden, yeah. and I'm fairly confident they date back to Edna Walling's time. Yeah. They may well be something sort of offbeat that Sangster and Taylor Nursery suggested she put in. Who knows? Or maybe they're on the sale table, because yeah, who yeah. doesn't love a bargain? <laughs> I do. I'm not sure that they had sales tables back then. But anyhow, there's three plants I'd like to engage with uh, that yes. are slightly offbeat and unexpected plants, particularly in this style of landscape. So let's go and have a wee look. Number one. All right, this way. Number one. Number one is Cordyline Indivisor, which is here behind us. Yeah. It's the mountain Cordyline from New Zealand. New Zealand has three main species. Yeah. This one comes from fairly high up in the mountains where it's nice and cool and yeah. moist. And it's something of a signature plant of Mount Macedon. And I have a sense that Mr. Sangster, or maybe Mr. Taylor, but mm. I think Mr. Sangster, mm. would have got a batch of these growing. Yeah. He may have even bought them directly in from New Zealand as growing plants. Yeah. And he would have, in his beautiful copper plate writing, written letters to all of the local garden owners and saying, I have got this wonderful importation that your garden must have. Mm. And I'm sure he did that a lot because there's a number of plants that show up again and again and again in different Mount Macedon gardens. Mm. And Cordyline in Divisor, which is not that easy to grow away from the hills, mm. would probably be a plant that Edna Walling wouldn't have been necessarily familiar with at all, mm. has ended up in this garden and they look to me to be about the right age to have been planted in the original landscape. Okay so let's recap it's a New Zealand native. Yes. Now why is it tricky? Because it grows in very damp moist cool forests. And it's an understory plant like it is here? Well it does sometimes erupt through the canopy of the plants in New Zealand but it is in those higher reaches where it gets very heavy rainfall particularly down the west coast of the South Island right. and so if it dries out at all it's inclined to just collapse and die. 
And you were saying you've had no luck growing it yourself. Well, at the bottom of Mount Macedon, where my garden is, I have a tendency to get a bit dry in the summer. And I've tried twice with cordyline Indivisor and lost it both times with the heat of summer. And that's literally just 10 minutes down the road. Yeah, exactly. So interesting. OK, well, let's go look at number two. All right. What a good idea. Number two. <laughs> well, another plant that I find really bizarre in this land. And I'm going to cunningly lens. flip yeah. the camera. Oh, Woo! look at this cinematography. That plant there yeah. is a very old specimen of Aurelia alata, which is a deciduous small tree, very unbranchy tree uh, yeah. from Asia. Uh, it does get interesting flowers on it. Its foliage can colour quite nicely before it sheds in the autumn. Mm. It definitely dates back to the Edna Walling era and again is a plant that I'm sure she never used before and possibly never used again. But how it ended up in this garden, unless it was a gift from somebody when the garden was first put in, mm. it has to be about the same era as Edna's planting and it is really slightly quirky. It's a very unusual thing to see in a garden like this. I don't think I understand it. I no. mean, it's not doing a lot. I mean, I get it. It's very leggy and it's got a lovely little sort of frothy canopy, yeah. but it's, it's, it's not a lot. No, <laughs> but it is, an ob uh, it is a, a collector's plant. It's an unusual right. thing. I've... There are some very desirable variegated forms of it out oh. in the trade you'll pay a vast amount of money for. So it's, it's about its quirkiness and it just doesn't seem to quite fit okay. the mould of what Edna Walling would have used in any other garden. Yes. So it's either have, has to have been something that, again, the cunning Mr Sangster had... Had on his in, list. Uh, you yeah, must have. Yes, you need to fill up that back corner with one of those he said and so I just don't quite understand its context to this garden mm. but it suits the garden it grows well in the garden well, it, it looks suits lovely the climate yeah and I'm sure there's not another one in an Edna Walling landscape anywhere else well let's go look at the third thing yes. that is striking your fancy all right what a good idea and number three all right number three has to be about the biggest Enchianthus perillatus I've ever seen in my life. Right. Now, the reason that this is an obscure sort of plant to have in a garden that Edna Walling designed, I yeah. think, mm. is that I'd be really surprised if she'd ever met an Enchianthus in her life before she did this job. Mm. Uh, it's only any good in the hill station gardens where you've got the cool climates, the deep mountain soils that are yeah. nice and acid, yeah. and it's a very slow growing shrub, quite hard to propagate. Mm. It would always have been scarce and still is around the nursery industry as we speak. Mm. And although it doesn't look a lot now, in the spring, it comes out with tiny little white lily of the valley like flowers that festoon the plant in the spring. Now, are these seed pods? Or yes, plants? you can see the little seed pods oh, just right. forming on it there. In the autumn, the whole tree will go the most intense burgundy red really? uh, in its foliage before it sheds so it has a good spring color mm. has a good autumn color and of course in the winter when it's bare it has a beautiful sculptural layered tiered effect to the tree yeah now that plant would have been an established plant when it was put in here uh, back, oh yes, back in the 1920s, mid-20s. Uh, it grows only about an inch or so a year, and so this plant has to date back to the Edna Walling era. Mm. But she would never have been able to use it in any of her Melbourne landscapes. It wouldn't survive in Melbourne. Mm. So again, it must have been a once-off, and again, I think the cunning Mr Sangster <laughs> might have convinced her to use this plant in her landscape. Or again, it was on the sale table. Yeah, but... and I might add, I'm really pleased that this plant is in the garden here, yeah. because there are two other species species of Enchianthus in other parts of the garden, mm. which I think have been added in later years, although are quite big plants now. Mm. And the gardener is very keen to collect them. So we're going to have an Enchianthus collection growing in Durrell before you know it. Wonderful. Well, mm. that's very exciting. That is just interesting to see these unusual plants in context. But let's go and talk about one of the most famous aspects of an Edna Walling garden. Oh, what a good idea. So Stephen, I guess Edna Walling is perhaps most famous for her stonework. Is that true? Yes. Um, she was very good at creating spaces and she tended to, to edge her spaces or enclose her spaces with stonework, which was quite a clever ploy because mm. stonework is inclined to survive where planting sometimes don't. So mm. uh, the signature that Edna used throughout her career was clever use of stonework. Yeah. And in fact, later in her career, well after she actually did the landscape here yeah. 
she found a stone worker, Mason, mm. man who worked with stone, called Alice Stone, uh, and he became famous in his own right and worked for Edna Walling for many, many years, yeah. doing most of her stone work, and in lots of cases was given quite a free reign to actually be creative with the stone work mm. and not completely sort of controlled by her as a landscape architect. Mm. So he became famous in his own right. But her stonework was always impeccably done. Well, this has survived and it looks in great condition. But so how did Edna's career develop? So here we are, 1925. Mm -hmm. What were the next stages? All right. Well, she developed quite a following. Yep. I mean, she became the landscape designer of her era. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was anybody wanted Edna Walling. Yeah. And, but her, like most people, her interests developed and changed. Yeah. So as she got towards the 1940s, mm -hmm. she became very enamored with Australian native plants. Mm -hmm. So her landscapes then started to take on a much more Australiana feel. The stonework was more relaxed yeah. uh, and therefore looked more like natural stone uh, out crops instead mm. of walls and edges that she'd used before. And how interesting, so firstly, this garden could be in Surrey, it could yeah. be an English, you know, suburban, large suburban garden. It's but a in, tiny lost garden of Heligan almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in 1940, to be start starting to champion native plants, mm. that she was way ahead of the curve. Yeah, in fact, she wrote a book on the Australian roadside yeah. and looking after our roadsides with native plants in. And it's still a book that is often sought after now it's a second-hand copy and so that was in the 1950s mm. the Australian native plant push really didn't get underway until the 1960s so she was probably the best part of 20 years before her time and just that natural revegetation movement about yep. verge sites as well I mean that's very contemporary in terms mm. of reforesting and rewilding yeah. areas wow yeah. so, so she was yeah. quite progressive she was very progressive mm. she was also a prolific writer mm. and that's part of the reason that she became as well known as she did and mm. has kept her place in the lexicon of uh, of landscape designers in Australia because mm. she wrote regularly for different magazines uh, she wrote quite a number of books during her lifetime so like Vita Sackville West who yeah. wrote for house and garden and she wrote gardening mm. books I don't know that she had quite as racy a private life as Vita Sackville West. Well, anyhow, yes, you could put her on that sort of level. There was no Mr. Wally. <laughs> no, there was no Mr. <laughs> Let's Wally. Let's just say. Yeah, so there you go. So, so yes, yeah, so she became an advocate of Australian native plant material. Mm. Alice Stone also, in his own way, his rock work developed with a much more Australiana feel about it. Yeah. Uh, and there's examples of his work uh, in a couple of different places, including the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. Mm. So, uh, so she was great at changing and other people who were good at what they did as good well. Good on her. And when did she shuffle off this mortal coil? She died at about 1979 up oh, in Queensland. Right. She'd moved up to Queensland with the idea of creating another village setting. She had one called Bickley Vale at Mural Bark here in Victoria. Which we might have the chance to visit at some I point. I think we will. So I be have more, an in. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be more Edna Walling stories. Yeah. yeah, so she'd done the Bickley Vale estate, which was a about these beautiful little arts and craft houses that she then sold on to people that had to sign all sorts of caveats about what they wouldn't and wouldn't do. So was she the developer? Yeah, she was basically wow. an early developer. So that's very entrepreneurial So well. she built the houses, she landscaped the gardens, they all tied in together, there was initially no fencing between Goodness the houses. Me, that's incredible. Uh, so she created this little sort of commune sort yeah. of thing yeah. with these cute as, uh, as a button little houses. Which we'll uh, go and have a look at. Yeah, we will at some point or another. And then she went up to Budrum in Queensland where she was intending to do a somewhat similar thing there. Mm. I think her health was starting to fail by that time yeah. and uh, so it never really eventuated and then she passed away as I said in 1979. But wouldn't it have been interesting to see what her version of a tropical garden would have been? I think it would have been fascinating. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so she certainly was prepared to dip her toes into lots of different yes. techniques and styles. There you go. Well, from a gardening pioneer to a horticultural expert, <laughs> Stephen Ryan, and your connection to this garden, which is equally as fascinating. What a great journey. It has been. And I think Durrell is one of those important Mount Macedon gardens that uh, I enjoy visiting and have done for 30 odd years probably. Well, I have enjoyed visiting. This is my first time here and it's really enchanting. It's a private garden. So we're incredibly grateful to the owners and to the head gardener for opening the gates to us today. Thank you very much. And don't forget we post every week. So 
hit the subscribe button uh, and the alert button and then you'll know what's coming up every week prior to it happening. And if you have a quick question for Stephen Ryan, put it in the comments below and we'll try and answer it in 60 seconds. We will indeed. Until then, we'll see you next week. All right, bye all.